Minister. Well, good morning. Can I welcome everybody to the 22nd meeting in 2014 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee? Can I remind everyone to switch off their mobile phones and any devices as they do affect the broadcasting system? Agenda item one today is homelessness in Scotland. As part of this inquiry, we will today hear from local authority and housing association representative groups. Also, I would note that the Equal Opportunities Committee has recently undertaken a short inquiry around youth homelessness, having and keeping a home, steps to preventing homelessness among young people. And today, Alex Johnson will act as rapporteur for the Equal Opportunities Committee, of which he is also a member. So today, can I welcome Janine Barrett, Principal Officer for Homelessness, and Julie Hunter, Housing Manage Strategy Manager from Alacho. Councillor Jimmy Black, um, who is Chair of Homelessness Prevention Group, and Silke Eastbrand, both of COSLA. David Bookbinder, Director of the Glasgow and West Something Forum, <laughs> GWSF, and Andy Young, Policy Manager from SFHA. Oh, and I missed Gavin Whitefield, Portfolio Holder for Housing Solace. So uh, can I welcome you all to this meeting and perhaps I can um, start off the questioning today. Um, uh, perhaps in general, could you make some brief com comments about the impact of the abolition, the, well the impact the abolition of priority need has had on the outcomes for homeless people? Who would like to start off? Gavin, yes. to say that the have risen to the challenge in, in addressing the abolition of priority need and the introduction of housing options. I think we have seen uh, very positive outcomes uh, as a consequence of that, and uh, that's a uh, reference within the, the, both the Solace and the Alacho submission, which uh, uh, cover a lot of uh, common ground. I think we recognise, however, that it is still uh, early days and there are still many challenges that remain, in particular the impact of welfare reform future funding challenges, uh, and also the, the need to ensure that we do uh, clearly illustrate and demonstrate the positive outcomes through the framework which has been uh, introduced as a consequence of the uh, regulator's report earlier this year, uh, and also how we, we cross-reference and we link uh, positive outcomes through the preventative approach uh, within the single outcome agreement, and I think there's, there's work to be done there. Uh, I think moving forward, there are opportunities to build on the partnership approach, which I think is a, an excellent example of uh, the preventative uh, agenda as, as, as recommended through the, the Christie Commission. Uh, there is a real commitment across all council services uh, to address this, along with our community planning partners, and uh, I'm sure we will see continued progress as we, as we move forward. Anyone else? Councillor Black. I think the old legislation, it, it seemed to suggest that it was acceptable to allow single people and childless couples to be on the street. I mean, that, that was a kind of implication of it. Um, it also meant that you had to waste time trying to assess whether or not somebody was in priority need. And uh, rather than actually look at the, the needs of that individual and you know, what you could do for them, you were trying to work out whether they were entitled to a service. So it's removed... Uh, an unnecessary area of complication and it means we can just get on with helping people now and that, that seems to be working. And the fact that homeless applications looking at the figures yesterday um, appear to be coming down um, shows that it hasn't led to a massive mushrooming of applications for homelessness. Um, so I think in general it's, it's not been a problem but what it has done is enable us to focus on the real needs of individuals and the prevention approach that Gavin outlined is absolutely central to that, the housing options approach. Anyone else? No? Okay, if we can move on to specific areas then, intentionally homeless decisions. Adam, you've got some questions on that. Yes. Um, of course, intentionally homeless applicants are, are not entitled to be rehoused in settled accommodation. But we've seen a rise in the number of people who've been classified as in intentionally homeless over the, the last year. Um, and as you pointed out, the number of homeless applications are, 
are actually falling, yet the number of intentionally homeless people are rising. Could you perhaps um, explain uh, what's the explanation for the increased number in intentionally homeless people? respond to some extent to that. Um, there has been a rise in, in the proportion of people found to be intentionally homeless, but that's because we now apply the test of intentionality to a much larger group of people who apply as homeless in the first place. When we previously had the priority need test um, as a hurdle that people had to get over to get a service, um, those people who were found to be homeless but not in priority need were not then tested for intentionality. So it stands to reason that the abolition of priority need has led to a slightly bigger proportion of people being now tested and found to be intentionally homeless. And I don't think it, it is a surprise to people because it had actually been heralded that that is likely to be an outcome of the abolition of priority need way before we ever got to the 2012 target. Well, uh, how would you then respond to evidence from the Govan Law Centre who said, and I quote, it's pretty clear that treating people as intentionally homeless is being used as a way not to offer a service to vulnerable people. I don't think that's accurate. Um, I think that across all local authorities, intentionally homeless households are being offered services. They've been offered access to integrated support assessments. They've been asked, um, given access to integrated support packages. We're providing temporary accommodation until the point of resettlement. What the homeless statistics also show is that there are a number of intentionally homeless households who actually move into settled accommodation. We move them into triple STs on an initial basis. But there are also a number of households that we hold on to until we can resettle them into private sector accommodation. So it's no longer the case that intentionally homeless households are just walked away from at the point where the decision is made. Local authorities continue to work with them to get the best housing outcome that we can, ensuring that they've got access to the appropriate support. Yes. Jim. Uh, I think... I doubt if anyone would say that the intentional homelessness provisions are completely satisfactory, but um, you, don't, you still have duties to intentional homeless people. Um, you still have to provide them with temporary accommodation. You have to provide them with practical help and advice to find suitable accommodation. And so, actually, there, there are so fairly extensive duties to help people who are intentionally homeless. One of the anomalies is, as far as I understand it, the housing support duties and that we brought in a couple of years ago don't actually apply to intentionally homeless people. But nonetheless, they still receive support from the various agencies of councils and of RSLs too, I think. Um, so it's not as if intentionally homeless people are getting no service at all. I think this is something that we need to look at, though, because if you look at the statistics that were published yesterday, the variation between some authorities is remarkable. Um, Dundee, my own authority, is down at 1.2% of people assessed as intentionally homeless. I think another authority is up at 22%. Now, why that is, it's, um, I think it would bear examination in every individual case to try and work out why that should be. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that people are using the intentional homelessness provisions deliberately to prevent people getting a service, but that could happen. So I think it's important that we understand the reasons for the variance, and that's one of the things we'll no doubt look at in the Homelessness Prevention Strategy Group uh, over the coming year. Yeah, it's obviously a, a, a concern that's out there, so I think we need to bottom this particular issue out and, and sort it out. I mean, I was interested in what you're saying, that it doesn't mean that intentionally homeless people don't get access to services. Um, it would be interesting to find out, you know, what the outcomes are for people who are uh, classified as intentionally homeless and how they might, that those outcomes might differ from uh, people who are classified as unintentionally homeless. Do, do you have any evidence uh, uh, 
to to lay before us, or could you provide us any evidence that that, that would be the case? Can I ask you something that we could look at? It's certainly something that we'll probably be recording through our HL1 information, so we'll have those outcomes. Um, so it's perhaps something we can go back to the Scottish Government and ask them to have a, a wider look at the HL1 statistics, just to show the outcomes for intentionally homeless households compared to unintentionally homeless households. So, that, yeah, I think the information is available. Just say that you don't have to touch your mics. Um, it's done for you here. I know it doesn't in councils, but if you don't touch your mics, please. Well, this, is, this is an issue I'm sure the committee will want to keep uh, uh, to monitor on an ongoing basis. So I certainly appreciate any, any feedback that you can provide, provide to us. OK. okay. Anyone else got questions on that? Okay, if we move on to housing options, Mary, you've got some questions on this. Thank you, Convener, and I wanted to explore a bit more the benefits of the, the housing options approach and how it's developed um, in Scotland over the last few years. So what have some of the practical benefits been of the, the use of the housing options approach? Um, and, and my colleagues who have a better technical knowledge can perhaps fill in the gaps. Um, the housing options approach is all about prevention of homelessness. It's prevention of the crisis. Um, what we've done in the past is we've dealt with the crisis when it arose. People have come to the housing department and said, I'm homeless, I already have no house, and I'm going to lose my house in a couple of weeks. And um, you know, then you've got a real problem trying to, trying to solve their, their difficulty. Um, the housing options approach isn't just for homeless people. It's for anyone who needs housing advice and assistance and help. And it means that you can catch people early and you can plug them into other council services and you know, whatever services they require much earlier than prevent the crisis happening. Because homelessness is a crisis and um, we really shouldn't get to that, that stage. And one of the things that I'm hoping will happen is that the housing options approach will develop to include all the council services and perhaps integration of health and social care will help here. So that um, if you look at the figures, you'll see that people often cite mental health as a problem. <laughs> Um, physical health is a problem that leads to their homelessness. There are a number of other factors where other council services, if they intervened earlier, could actually prevent the crisis happening. So that's where I see housing options as being really crucial. The other thing is it enables um, people who may have little understanding of the housing market locally to get expert advice about what the options are. Now, the options in some rural areas might be very few and far between. In urban areas, you might have housing associations, councils, and a number of options within those things, and the private rented sector, and so on. So um, it's important that the, the housing options providers have a really good knowledge of the housing market locally, so that they can actually plug people into something which will prevent them ever getting near the point of becoming homeless. completely changed the way local authorities think and the way we respond to our customers. We've gone being, from being process driven and driving people down a homelessness route to being far more holistic when we consider what people's needs are. I think we're far more person centred. The housing option approach is far more person centred and it really does empower people to make choices and because people are invested in the choices they make, the opportunity for sustainability accommodation is far greater and therefore we're reducing the risk of repeat homelessness and repeat crisis in the future. Authorities at different stages in, in, in addressing this and the, the introduction and development of the regional hubs is, I think, a, a very welcome development to share best practice and ensure that uh, we are all operating to the highest standards, that uh, we're not just looking at the narrow housing solutions, but looking at the solutions which involve other council services and, indeed, uh, partner services, including the, the voluntary sector and the, the, the health sector. David. The change that colleagues have talked about is, is steadily happening within the housing association sector as well on housing options. I mean, historically, it's been a pretty automatic uh, process, as, as Janine referred to it. It's a good word to use because the sense is somebody applies, they've got a legal right to go on your housing list as, as a housing association, and that's what, ha and that's what happens. And, and uh, it can be as little as a sort of 10, 15 minute kind of interview uh, checking of circumstances. And that, that sense now that's certainly in Glasgow, for example, where the housing options approach is being rolled out to, to pushing on 50 
housing associations uh, uh, that will happen steadily over the next uh, a couple of years it really it really is making a difference it's making a difference for for, for people who don't sort of um, uh, fester on a housing list when they've no real chance of, of housing um, uh, instead that their actual current circumstances are looked at and they may well end up registering on on, on the list or with a common housing register or, or, or whatever but it's not a kind of blind, you know, we, we, never mind your current circumstances, you, 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 you can go on the list. It really has changed that approach. And the difference is casework, probably, that instead of giving somebody advice about a current housing problem, it may well mean the housing officer in the housing association taking a casework approach and trying to sort that problem out. It could be housing benefit, problem in the private rented sector, it could be a family issue. Uh, and that, that's really changing how associations deal with applications as well. of health and social care perhaps being um, beneficial um, is, is something that I suppose could be um, expanded on as, as, as you progress because that's more likely to pick up more vulnerable, vulnerable groups whether it's people that might be suffering from drug or alcohol abuse, people that are leaving hospital, um, young care leavers. Um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on how that could be progressed to support people that would be leaving prison. Is that, is that something you could see that could be developed to work with partner organisations for it, like the Scottish Prison Service? 